Richard Gibson was the head of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee uh, before the time of the assassination. Many documents have been released about him and many more were just released in the 2022 release. And he has been a topic of interest for me for, for a while now. And uh, it is uh, a fact that eventually he became an agent for the CIA. But at one time, of course, he was not an agent for the CIA. And what I'm looking into in this video is to try to determine exactly when he became an agent of the CIA. In furtherance of this endeavor, I have arranged the files that I have on Gibson in chronological order. And I have chosen some key files uh, to illustrate the evolution of his relationship with the CIA and also with the FBI. He also offered himself to the FBI, but he ended up working for the CIA. And I find these files to be the key files among the ones I have. And this is a September 11th, 1962 FBI file where this first information comes from. This agency received a letter. Well, this is actually the CIA talking in this context. This agency received a letter dated 4 July 1962 on stationery of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, signed a friend. In the letter, the writer indicated he could be of assistance to this agency, suggested Montreal, Canada as a discreet location for a meeting if this agency were interested in discussing the possibilities of cooperation asked that this agency arrange for his transportation and expenses while in Montreal, and requested that he be personally contacted by phone at the committee's address or at his home. The committee stationary letterhead contained two names, Robert Tabor, Executive Secretary, and Richard Gibson, Acting Executive Secretary. From the letter, there was no way to determine whether Tabor, Gibson, or some other person wrote the letter. This agency took no action on the letter. Mr. Wallen made available a copy of the above letter to Mr. Krieger on 16 July 1962. On 19 July 1962, Philip K. Rice, Department of Agriculture, Code 111, Extension 6660, requested an interview with a representative of this agency. Rice, a former employee of this agency, was subsequently interviewed on 20 July 1962, at which time he produced a personal letter dated 16 July 1962 from Richard Gibson, Fair Play for Cuba Committee, to Thornton Haggard, uh, Rice's stepbrother. Rice explained that Gibson was a friend of his stepbrother, and apparently at some time in the past his stepbrother had told Gibson that he, Rice, was a former employee of this agency, the CIA. In the letter, Gibson asked Haggart to tell Rice to inform his, Rice's former employers, the CIA, that he, Gibson, had written a letter several weeks ago discreetly trying to get in touch with this agency. Time was running out. It was a matter of life or death. Suggested Montreal as a meeting place and suggested this agency contact him at his office in New York or his home. Mr. Wallen made available a copy of this second letter to Mr. Krieger on 22 July 1962. Rice was informed on 24 July 1962 that he, Rice, would be contacted by the FBI with regard to the latter. And so far as I can tell, neither one of these letters is available for us to look at. So this represents Gibson's earliest attempt, so far as I can tell, to put himself to work for American intelligence and with the CIA specifically. There, there are other documents where he talks to the FBI. I'm not going to deal with that in this video. He prefers the CIA to the FBI. But anyway, Jan, uh, July 4th is the date I'm giving to this first attempt to sell himself, because he does want money, to the CIA. And then we have an October 26th 1962 CIA document in which Gibson is uh, uh, had written a letter on the 17th 
And they quote him here as saying, I can still be of use to you, even from here, if you think it worthwhile. The committee should shut down within a few days without any serious difficulties, especially now that Lee, and he means Vincent T. Lee, has learned he isn't going to get any money from our friends in the Caribbean. Or, as I said before, redacted. I would like to know what that redaction is, and in 2022, why we can't see that. If I am no longer here, Tony will know where to reach me. So, on October 26th, apparently Gibson is still not working for the CIA, but he's still offering. And this is from what is identified as a January 22nd, 1963 document. The document itself is a little messy. I don't know why, but the cover sheet says it's January 22nd. And in there it says, It is to be noted that Richard Gibson's offer of his services to the FBI and or CIA for financial reimbursement is set forth in the interview of Gibson inasmuch as the Bureau and the CIA made a determination not to use Gibson's services. The purpose in setting this forth is to show the character of Gibson, who is the principal functionary of the FPCC. Now, he had left the country by now. I guess they're still associating him with the FPCC, even though he's really not. I think, I don't know what his, when his official break came, but he's already out of the country at this point. But anyway, on January 22nd, 1963, the document tells us that Gibson is not in the employ of the CIA or the FBI. And the next document is from September 30th. 1963. And in this document it says, and what, wait a minute, what is this? This is a, uh, a, C, a CIA document. Inside here it says, we previously requested State Department and CIA to alert their sources when Gibson left the U.S. for Algeria. Subsequently, CIA advised by liaison that it was giving consideration to possible utilization of Gibson as an intelligence mission on an intelligence mission inside Cuba and future utilization of Gibson by CIA would depend upon his performance in Cuba. It is noted subject during previous FBI interview in the U.S. indicated he would assist FBI and or CIA in return for financial remuneration or remuneration but not due to allegiance to U.S. He stated he did not like the FBI and, and matter was referred to CIA. Ordinarily, we would furnish information from files to sources abroad through our legal attaches. However, in this instance, in this instance, it is felt that CIA should be authorized to so handle in view of its previous interest in the subject. Further, this is first indication of subject's residence in Switzerland, and Legat Bern has no prior background concerning this matter. So the, the CIA is considering using Gibson, and I take from that that they are still not currently using Gibson, but it is under consideration. And uh, this is uh, September 30th, 1963. And in this October 11th, 1963, CIA dispatch to the station in Bern, from the station in Geneva, uh, they, they say that the CIA would appreciate receiving any additional information concerning the whereabouts and activities of Gibson, which may come to your attention. So I take from this another indication that He's not working for the CIA, otherwise they probably wouldn't be asking for information. So, uh, in October, on October 11th, he's still not working for the CIA. And then on November 22nd, 1963, JFK is assassinated. And on November 23rd, we have an intercepted uh, telephone call between R Richard Gibson and, at this point, an unidentified person on the other side, on the other line. And uh, discussion is had here of Oswald. I'll get back to this. I view this 
as probably the turning point, probably when the F, when the CIA decided it wanted to take up Gibson on his offer. But anyway, this is here, uh, and up to this point, there is no indication that the CIA is actually employing Gibson. And then the assassination happens, and then this telephone call happens. And then the next information I can find on this topic of whether or not he's working for them, which is explicit anyway, uh, doesn't come until November 15th, 1965, this uh, FBI document. It says, Subject Gibson was head of Fair Play for Cuba Committee at one time and is now living in London where he is connected with some communist publications. In 1962, Subject offered to serve as informant for the for Bureau solely for financial reasons, but we declined and told the CIA of his offer. In September 1965, CIA advised it is now directing Gibson's activities. So here it is, the first time on the record I can find anywhere where it is explicitly stated that the CIA is directing Gibson's activities, but this is uh, in September 1965 that the FBI was told this by the CIA. So here I've summarized that information, and of course as, as it is presented, what seems to turn the corner on his relationship is the assassination and that intercepted phone call. Of course we don't have, there's a big gap there between the assassination and November 15, 1965, that's about two years, where we don't know. We don't have any information on the record that I can find uh, addressing this issue of whether uh, Gibson does or does not work for the CIA. Now, the turning point, as I've said, I think, is this intercepted phone call. I'm not going to have time in this video to deal with the content of the phone call, or any of its follow-up analysis, but I'm just going to note that this occurred on November 23rd, 1963. And the next document dealing with new information coming from Gibson comes from this document from the, the State Department, I guess, the Foreign Service, American Embassy, Paris, France, December 19th, 1963. Apparently on December 4th, 1963, Mr. Darwin Curtis, if that is his real name, a CIA officer, Paris, advised on December 19th, 1963, that Richard Gibson was interviewed by Mr. John Gossett, acting consul, American Embassy, Paris, on December 9th, 1963. All right, I guess it's, the interview was on December 9th. 1963, but it's Mr. Curtis of the CIA who's saying what happened. So it looks to me as if Gibson and the CIA have finally joined up by December 9th, and I think the reasonable interpretation for what caused this change was that intercepted phone call. I guess I'll have to make a video on the phone call itself uh, to, to explain why the CIA changed their mind, why I think they changed their mind. But I think it's the phone call that did it, because after this, there are no documents that wonder whether or not or wh they want to hire Gibson. There's no more of that talk about uh, considering hiring him or him offering his services. After that, that stops. And the next word we have is that the CIA is directing his activities. So I think that's it. I think it's this phone call that is the turning point in the relationship between the CIA and Richard Gibson.